Okay. So we're live now with the Energy Utilities and Technology Committee. I'm Mark Lawrence, the Senate Chair of the committee. And uh, we are going to have uh, a series of presentations today, and we're gonna have work sessions following that. And we have had some changes to what appears on the top of the website. Um, so you should scroll down and look at the uh, document that appears on the lower right hand of the screen to find out exactly what we're planning to do today. Um, we do have a couple of different presentations. Um, and one of them is from the Connect Me Authority. And we did have a request from Mr. Butcher to go uh, try to get out by 10 o'clock because of uh, conflicts. And so we'll go first to um, Andrew Busher and Peggy Schaefer. If you could beam them over, Jason, and we'll ask them to do their presentation. Good morning, Andrew. Are you all set to begin? Good morning, I am. Um, and uh, thank you, Senator Lawrence. Um, I see Peggy Schaefer patching over as well. Uh, if it's okay, if it pleases the committee, I think uh, uh, I'll be given a, a, a quick update and progress report on activities with the Maine Connectivity Authority in tandem to uh, her update and report for Connect Maine. Um, okay. Yeah. And I apologize, Andrew, I forgot to allow committee members a chance to introduce themselves. So we have um, only about half the committee here today, and that's because um, all committee members um, have multiple activities going on at the same time. Other legislative committees uh, are meeting that they have to be in on those meetings, and some of our members serve on multiple committees. But we do have a quorum here of seven members. And I'm going to ask my co-chair to introduce himself first. Good morning, everyone. I'm Seth Berry. I represent House District 55, which is Bowden, Bodenham, almost all of Richmond, and beautiful Swan Island on the Kennebec. Thank you, Representative Berry. And then I'm going to go to uh, Senator Vitelli. Yes, good morning, everyone. I'm Senator Eloise Vitelli. I represent all of Sagadot County and the town of Dresden in Lincoln County. Representative Cuddy. Good morning, my name is Scott Cuddy. I represent House District 98, which is Winterport, Frankfort, Searsport, and Swanville, and I reside in Winterport. Representative Foster. Good morning, I'm Steve Foster. I represent District 104, which includes five towns, Dexter, Garland, Charleston, Stetson, and Exeter. Representative Kessler. Hi, my name is Chris Kessler, representing part of South Portland and part of Cape Elizabeth. Representative Grahowski. Good morning, I'm Nicole Grahowski. I represent House District 132 of the city of Ellsworth in the town of Trenton. Okay, and for members of the public, you may see members coming in and out. As I've said, they all have multiple Zooms to do this morning on various committees. And we're trying at this point in the legislative session to keep things moving along at a, um, at a good pace. So members are placing priorities on committees where they actually have work sessions or public hearings. Um, so they'll be popping in and out. And as different people pop in, I'll have them introduce themselves. We are here this morning, first off, for presentations. So that has, not that it's less important, but in the process of trying to get all legislation out of committees, um, legislators are, are placing priority on working bills right now and completing their public hearings. So I do apologize, Andrew, and we'll go back to your presentation. No, no, no problem at all. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to catch you up. Uh, as I mentioned, I think Peggy and I are, are planning on a little bit of a, a tag team conversation, um, if that's okay. Um, my goal, uh, my, my goal um, by way of update on the main connectivity authority would just be to provide you with an update on our priorities and progress um, and respond to whatever questions you all may have. As you saw, our, our uh, official legislative report submission was quite light as we are brand new. So there were no activities to report in the last year um, as I have started in my official capacity this year. Um, and so thank you all once again for that opportunity. Um, 
So if it's if it works for you, Peggy, I'll just go through a couple quick priorities and uh, progress report, and then I, I imagine uh, the the most amount of juicy conversation will be on the connect main sides of things. And again, I am sorry about my time limitations today. Um, uh, I think we'll be good by 10 o'clock and, and I do apologize, I'll have to jump by 10. Um, so uh, I, I don't think I need to go through um, our, our intent and design and purpose for uh, the connectivity authority with this committee. Um, and I do apologize, I don't have an official slide deck or presentation to share with you at this point. It's been a busy uh, couple months. So I'm just gonna talk through our, our priorities and progress. Um, uh, and, and some of you who were a part of uh, last night's broadband caucus uh, heard a little bit of this discussion as well. Um, you know, uh, as a brand new agency, um, uh, our, we have I think three simultaneous priorities um, and they are to uh, get our federal funding relief uh, funds in motion as quickly as possible to scale up our organization to ensure um, the ability to sustain the unprecedented opportunity before us um, and to ultimately develop and execute a strategy that serves as a roadmap both for us as an organization as well as provides clarity and transparency for our network of partners, public and private and community. Um, so just progress on those fronts, um, working backwards, uh, hopefully folks have seen the strategic summary that is posted on the main connectivity website, main connectivity authority website. Um, that strategic summary serves as a distillation of six months of stakeholder engagement and board strategy, um, very much serving as a roadmap um, that distills, you know, really three priority focus areas, um, projects that optimize deployment and reduce barriers, um, uh, focus on uh, places to reach the last mile and build upon our, our existing capacity towards community-driven regional scale approaches, um, and a focus around people that advances digital equity across multiple sectors and silos. Um, those strategic focus areas then unpack into a series of activities, which I am uh, executing on and building staff around. Um, I'm pleased to share that we have a CFO hired who will be joining in March. That announcement will be official next week. Um, and uh, it's a tremendous addition to the team, uh, somebody with a pretty significant experience around large scale financing, uh, development and partnerships. Um, which as you know, is, is a sort of key feature of the authority. Um, and uh, this individual has been hired out of a competitive search um, that received national applications. Um, I think we feel very excited about that. Uh, we are hiring an operations administrator to start in March. And then I am also uh, hopefully in the next week putting out job descriptions for uh, three new positions and ultimately aiming to hire uh, seven to eight by midsummer, so that we will be uh, fully operational um, in addition to building upon the, the strong partnership with Connect Maine, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, I will also just note, I really appreciate all of your collective support in spreading the word around emerging opportunities for the authority. Um, I'm really pleased to see that I've seen some great candidates from some of your districts, I, I presume, uh, due to the work that you've uh, helped spread the news around. So I, I appreciate your partnership and support along those lines. And, you know, as we continue to staff up, that will continue to be important. Um, so, uh, you know, the other sort of key point of progress to highlight is hopefully you all have noted, um, and I included in my uh, legislative report to you as well. I'm, I'm very pleased that the Connectivity Authority Board approved uh, an allocation of 10 million of funds to connect Maine at our January board meeting. Um, again, that sort of follows through on the commitment to, to get money moving as quickly as possible. And those funds uh, stack with the existing bond, remaining bond funds that connect Maine has been distributing for a, a total available pool of 16 and a half million for the current spring infrastructure round, grant round, um, which uh, is significant in that I believe it's the most funds made available to communities at any given time. Um, and so uh, that 
Um, also represents an opportunity for Peggy and team and I to uh, be able to map out how we will adapt and iterate that uh, last mile grants program, which will be administered by the connectivity authority um, starting this summer. Um, uh, that partnership, which I'm sure Peggy and I will talk a little bit more about, I, I feel like is strong. And I think it was a very clear message from this committee and all of our collective stakeholders that we don't want to disrupt the marketplace. And we want to be able to um, flex our muscle and, and do things in new ways. And so we are actively, are, we've got an MOU that describes as much um, and I think provides us with a pretty good roadmap for how to get there. Um, I also just want to highlight that I think a key feature of the Connectivity Authority is our ability to um, proactively engage new partnerships um, and to focus on interagency collaboration, which was a key feature identified in our stakeholder engagement and board strategy. Um, and I'm really pleased to share that we have an active collaboration with the State Department of Transportation uh, and the Intelligent Transportation Systems Group engaged me very early um, to partner on a feasibility study of understanding uh, how and where to leverage our transportation assets to address not just our transportation communication needs, but ultimately the state's connectivity needs. Um, there's a lot of roads, there's a lot of access to rights of way, there's a lot of infrastructure for shared, for shared use. Um, understanding what that looks like and what the technology and the financial implications are is step one, and we are underway with a feasibility assessment to do so, in addition to uh, sharing a staff member. So yesterday we had the we were invited to share with a network of state broadband leaders um, how Maine is advancing interagency collaboration and Connect Maine Stephanie McLagan and the Department of Transportation's Colby Fortier Brown spoke to um, how those interagency collaborations are taking shape. So I think it's a really good thing that Maine is getting showcased nationally for this orientation. Um, so I'll pause there because I feel like I'm talking too long. Um, I'm happy to respond to questions that folks have. Um, and I'm also happy to uh, tag in with Peggy as we drill into um, specifics around our, our uh, partnership with Connect Maine and the Connectivity Authority. Great, Andrew, thank you. Now, did you want Peggy to present something first before questions or do you want to go directly to questions and have Peggy come in for technical answers? As, as I think as you please, uh, whatever, whatever okay. preference for you all. So why don't we go ahead with questions and then we'll have Peggy join us when, uh, when she needs to answer something specifically on a question. So are there questions uh, from the committee for Andrew? Representative Barry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, thank you, President Butcher uh, for uh, giving us a little update on the main connectivity authority. So last night, as you referenced at the Legislative Broadband Caucus, we spoke a bit about the governor's announcement last week, her, her pledge, as she called it, that by 2024, every Maine resident who wishes to have high-speed internet will be able to have it. And um, that was, uh, you know, obviously, um, a, a big announcement and it pushes up the timetable considerably from, you know, what we have spoken about in the past. So I just want to ask you to comment on the feasibility of that goal as, uh, as you understand it with the, the work of the Connect Main Authority, <clears throat> the resources you have, um, and in particular, what will be needed from the legislature to make sure that we can uh, live up to that pledge. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I appreciate um, the opportunity to speak to that. I was, I was about to dive into it, but I also realized I didn't want to hold the floor for too long. Um, uh, I mean, we spoke about it last night, but just to emphasize, this is an incredibly bold and exciting goal. Um, and I feel like the, the immediate response is that we can do it and we will do it and we have to do it. Um, uh, and it, it comes from a recognition uh, that is baked into the charter for the Connectivity Authority um, that I heard time and time again from members of this committee and beyond. Um, uh, we can't be looking at the scale of investment. We can't be looking at creating our future 
internet infrastructure and redefining our economy while close to 80,000 households are still uh, without service. And so due to the good work that Connect Maine has facilitated in the creation of their broadband intelligence platform, um, we now have a much better understanding of where those uh, premises are um, and now the ability to think strategically around how we provide uh, incremental and phased connectivity for those that don't have it. So the pledge means really three important things uh, from a connectivity authority standpoint. Um, first, we have to continue investing in the community-driven approach that has been working in Maine. With our market and geographic conditions, uh, a community-driven approach represents uh, uh, the best way of identifying potential market demand, which equates to take rate, which equates to sustainable investments. So we will continue investing in that and we will continue to iterate and refine that which is working now and be proactive about addressing that which has not been working as well as it could. Um, secondly, uh, as you all well know, this is an opportunity to reshape our internet ecosystem and to be strategic around the backbone and middle mile investments that we can make that create a more competitive and more fair and more affordable landscape for uh, the private sector and ultimately for consumers. Um, and so we've not really had that ability to make those choices. And even if you go back and you look at our, our decisions around investments in the three ring binder, that was a singular investment um, that had a number of its own con constraints and parameters. Um, and uh, ultimately as a state, it allowed for some progress and it also allowed for some value to remain on the table. We should be strategic and proactive in thinking about how to capture that value long term. And we can do that in parallel to investing in that community process. And simultaneously to that, the third priority is that um, uh, we have to invest in and embrace alternative technologies where appropriate. Um, this does mean partnerships and investments in wire fixed wireless solutions um, uh, and other technologies that um, will, will enable short-term connectivity for those that don't have it, but to be strategic around how that fits into a broader approach at a regional scale so that those short-term investments allow for a pathway for consumers and businesses to be able to um, uh, not have to give up the long-term benefit of uh, the longer-term set of solutions. So, um, all that to sort of say, uh, I'm really pleased that the governor's call to action is a call to action for us all. It's not a statement that the connectivity authority is going to be solving at all. We have an unbelievable opportunity to do so, but it has to be in alignment with the way in which municipalities and counties and regional partnerships are looking at um, their solutions. So um, I think it's an it's a excellent call to action for all of us, and it certainly is in line with the strategy and the priorities that have been developed for the Connectivity Authority. Um, and I know Peggy has additional thoughts and perspective on it as well. Um, and so I'm happy to have her speak to that. But Representative Barry, am I, uh, is, this a, is, is this a helpful response to your question? It, it, it helps with one part of it. I heard you say that we can do this and that we all need to play a part. And I guess just to put a finer point on the, on the question that I have, um, given the very brief time remaining for this legislature to take action, um, what, if anything, do you need from us? Whether it's statutory authorities, um, whether it is efforts to rally the troops back home or whether it is resources. Because as you know, um, legal changes and resources, for that matter, community conversations take time. And we're talking about a two year time frame for this, uh, this pledge to be to, to become reality. So, yeah. um, you know, I, I, I think now is the time, uh, if, if there uh, will be a time to ask us for anything that the legislature can do to assist. Well, first of all, thank you for that. Um, that orientation and, and, and that opportunity. Um, as a, a, a career and having a career in entrepreneurship and, and nonprofit management, uh, the orientation should always be to say yes. Um, and so um, I want I guess I'll take the opportunity to 
um, convey that sentiment to our board and partners and see if I can get you um, a more specific set of responses because I absolutely hear the offer and want to take you up on it. Um, um, and in the short term, I think, you know, part of our recognition is that um, uh, right now, I think one of the biggest things that would be helpful is the amplification of um, the general sentiment that we can do these, these, these things in parallel. We can continue investing in communities. We can continue, we, we can build out our middle mile and we can embrace alternative technologies in a way that's not mutually exclusive. So helping manage the listening, you know, I think unfortunately I, I had people reach out to me and say, so does this mean we're, we're gonna be spending all of our money on Starlink? No, this is not what that means. Um, and other people coming to us and saying, oh, so we don't need to do anything anymore. No, that is not what this means. And so your help in amplifying that everybody still, if you're, if you're working towards this, you need to keep pulling and you actually need to help make your priorities as clear as possible to us. And we need to be, you know, we are building out as many pathways as possible to understand what those priorities are at a place-based level. So your help in amplifying that everybody still has an important job to do here and that we can do more than one thing at once. One size does not fit all. And we've actually, in my limited time in working with our communities and our, and our state, I don't think that in recent history, we've ever really had the opportunity to, to, to embrace multiple strategies at once. I don't wanna say it's been all or nothing, but we've had limited resources and limited capacity. Um, we certainly don't have unlimited resources and unlimited capacity because resources and capacity are always an issue, but we have a much bigger opportunity and we can do things in parallel. And that's what probably I need your, the most help in amplifying. Um, and then even more so, you know, just to be very specific about it, um, uh, we will be building out and expanding upon the criteria for grants and finance, financing opportunities. I think it's really, really important that localities, municipalities, and counties um, have a meaningful stake in the solutions that we look at. Um, and many, many of our counties and municipalities are being strategic and proactive about that, and there's a lot of great examples to point to. And I think some are feeling that they should hedge their bets. And, and I get that limited resources needs to be spread a lot of different ways, but um, we need, there needs to be some level of engagement and participation with municipalities and counties, especially as it pertains to allocation of rescue plan resources. So I think your help in amplifying that message, I think is sort of the, the threshold. And again, uh, allow me the opportunity to get back to you with any further thoughts or requests as, as Peggy and I consult with our boards and stakeholders. Thank you. And if, if I may, Mr. Chair. Great. Um, Go ahead, Representative Barry. It, it will be, um, it would be fantastic to have as a follow-up to this conversation, just a punch list of what, it, what specifically, as specifically as possible is, uh, is needed or desirable from uh, legislators generally um, to help you know, you to carry this work forward. And, you know, I'll, I'll certainly want to invite um, Director Schaefer to, to uh, comment on the same set of questions. So thank you very much. Thank you. Representative Foster. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Lutra, for being here this morning and for your presentation. Uh, following up on Representative Barry's uh, uh, questioning, uh, this time frame that you've, this goal that's been set by the uh, Chief Executive uh, certainly is a, a short one when we consider where we are and you know how long ago we started on this uh, broad band uh, project, uh, if you will. Uh, my question is, uh, and and certainly uh, Connect Maine is in the middle of all this. It's not like you, even though the authority is just getting started and still has a lot of uh, uh, work to do to to get to a full functioning. Uh, entity, if you will. Uh, projects are ongoing right now, have been completed and, and are on the drawing board, so to speak. My question is, do we think it's possible with the constraints on materials that we have, the, the uh, uh, and of course the increasing costs of materials, uh, 
and the commitment to get to that last person on that last mile, uh, their residents uh, with broadband, uh, do you think that that's really possible in the time frame that the governor has set for you? Um, the short answer to your question, Representative Foster, and thank you for that. Um, uh, and thank you for the acknowledgement that um, uh, time, materials, and labor are pretty important considerations in the grand scheme of things. Um, and they are the kinds of things that I think uh, haunt us all as we look at um, long-term and strategic investments. The short answer to your question is yes. Um, and uh, what I will say, and I think folks from this committee probably well know, and, and um, I think as has been pretty clear uh, from a state policy standpoint, uh, investments in fiber infrastructure is the gold standard um, that we should be aiming for and aspiring for. Um, and uh, where possible, I think we want to enable that and we wanna be strategic and as public as stewards of public funds to be able to invest in those kinds of long-term future-oriented infrastructure for businesses, consumers, residents. Um, and, you know, I think we hear loud and clear that there are many, many businesses, consumers, and households that uh, can't afford to wait the time that it's going to take for those projects to come together, uh, the resources to be secured, and the finances to be in place. And we acknowledge that. And so that's why in part of my response to the governor's pledge, this does mean that uh, to reach many of those uh, remote and hard to connect uh, premises, we are going to have to invest in partnerships for uh, non-wired solutions um, and um, being strategic about that. And so, you know, I think to your question, there are a number of places that we're going to have to embrace that. And, and it's a recognition that uh, if, if you have to make choices between um, whether you can be on a, a work Zoom or whether your child can participate in remote school or, you know, your, your parent has to visit with their doctor, um, we shouldn't be forced to make those kinds of choices and trade-offs. And um, we've heard loud and clear that people don't want to have to wait for a perfect solution. And so, uh, again, it's this sentiment of we can do multiple, we, we can embrace multiple strategies in parallel. Um, so I know Peggy's probably going to have some additional thoughts in response to that, but um, just to clarify and to emphasize, this, this is a recognition that we will embrace strategic partnerships for non-wired solutions in strategic places. Thank you, if I may, Mr. Chair. Go ahead, take that as you guess. Go ahead, uh, Mr. Foster. Thank you, uh, Mr. Bush. And as a follow-up, and you've touched on this already, it was a question I was going to have for you. I think I've kind of got an answer. Uh, obviously, and, and Ms. Shaver can, uh, uh, testify to this fact that I've always talked about making sure we get the most fiber, most connection per dollar that we can. Uh, and I think you and I, I think I brought that up during uh, your confirmation. Uh, but my, my question is, there's currently a bill that was held over uh, uh, that uh, was a bipartisan bill, uh, LD 1107, uh, Senator Stewart and Senator Jackson sponsored for uh, assisting in this matter, if you will, to allow some folks uh, the ability to acquire uh, satellite uh, broadband. Uh, I know that uh, uh, even folks who are currently living where fiber optic broadband is available are converting over. And I know in, now it's, it's spread throughout you know, the zone that's uh, where that Starlink, for instance, is available, has spread uh, to my area. And uh, I've talked to folks that have uh, multiple devices and they're, they're carrying uh, those very well without the buffering that I'm seeing with my fiber optic cable and, you know, on when I'm watching uh, the news or whatever. I'm wondering uh, if the uh, position has now possibly changed because whenever this was brought up before and during the uh, uh, hearing on 1107, we pretty much were told that uh, satellite was not an option that uh, fiber was the answer and, and that was it. And, and that question, even before that, when it was brought up, that was the answer. So I'm wondering uh, if you can just confirm that that has changed and, and, uh, and if you would make sure that uh, 
we are looking at that possibly that bill may be amending it to uh, to to utilize that to help out to, if that's necessary, as Representative Barry referred to in your list of things you need. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Foster. I'm I'm really glad that you're bringing this bill and this question up. Thank you so much for asking it. Um, uh, and uh, I remember I remember well. Actually, I think it was uh, uh, one that I testified on in particular. Um, and. Uh, I'm really pleased to say that I, I've actually spoken with Senator Stewart. I don't, I don't know. I don't think he's here right now. Um, I have spoken with Senator Stewart in, in follow up several times about that bill. And um, my sentiment remains the same in that I, I don't think that bill was the right mechanism to achieve the goals um, for a variety of reasons um, in that I don't think that um, I think there are still many questions regarding um, affordability and viability of that particular service. That said, where it is possible, it's a very good solution for us to be able to embrace, but there's still many questions. Even last week, I think I saw some articles that there were over 40 satellites that um, exploded, caught fire, went down. Um, uh, there it is still in a beta test mode and it's still unclear what happens when more people sign up for the service and whether it gets diluted. Um, and so I don't, we are not going to prohibit it. And I also think that we want to be strategic around where we can make it as available as possible. Starlink already uh, received a significant public subsidy to be able to provide service in targeted pockets in Maine through the rural digital opportunity fund through the, Federal Communications Commission. Um, so uh, my sense, my, my, my general standpoint is that uh, we should be strategic in making uh, uh, services like Starlink available in the places where it makes the most sense and in a measured and intentional way. I don't think that that bill in particular helps us achieve that. And I worry about the precedent that it sets for providing that kind of subsidy to that kind of private company. Um, uh, so for those, for those reasons, uh, I've, I've, uh, as I mentioned, I've engaged with Senator Stewart and I've invited him to join a, uh, an innovation advisory committee that the Connectivity Authority has established to engage with some research institutions and some private service providers to be able to identify what is the technology that makes the most sense in different geographies to be able to provide that kind of short-term um, connectivity assistance and what's the financing model and the subsidy that should be a part of that. I think that we can do that without the legislation in place. And again, I worry about the precedent that the legislation would set. Um, and I'm really pleased. I, I think Senator Stewart certainly had let him speak on his, on his behalf. I, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, I think he's planning on joining and participating in that working group. And I'll be making a trip to his district in about a month to be able to meet with him and um, the county and the uh, RISTIC partnership and several other stakeholders to get a better understanding of where their priorities are and what kinds of technology partnerships would make the most sense. I hope that addresses your question. Uh, yes. Uh, are you all set, Representative Foster, or do you have a follow-up? Well, yeah, just to follow up if I could. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Vocher. That, that does answer part of my question. Uh, and it sounds like, and I'm not looking that that's something that would be provided for everyone in, in addition to fiber, but it sounds like what you're referring to would be an answer to some of those, you know, we always use the analogy that there's a, a farmhouse down at the end of a half mile, a mile lane that, uh, you know, rather than spend, and I don't know what the amount is now, but let's say $10,000 to run fiber to that uh, place, uh, at least the uh, thought behind Senator Stewart's bill was that, you know, allowing them $500 to get going and, and there would be a, a better answer. Uh, however, in my area, and certainly in areas more rural than mine, we have many homes, residences that are located at the end of poles and wires for electricity in that we have stretches of road that don't have poles because the next residence up the road, two or three miles away, is served by uh, power, if you will, and, and, and phone service from the other end. And uh, so that quite often that last house on that line is located significant distance from 
the other the the next residents on that line. So that that's you know there are many cases where that uh, stringing fiber uh, uh, cost per residence can can be greatly uh, uh, exaggerated under those circumstances. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. I, I feel um, the short response to that is just simply that. Um, uh, that also it's for that reason that we will be baking in, we will be developing and launching some kind of line extension program um, in tandem to thinking about if a line extension is cost prohibitive or doesn't, wouldn't work, what are the wireless solutions that would provide, that would make the most sense in those kinds of areas and, you know, data and maps and, and more humans to help with that kind of analysis and partnerships will actually enable that. And that's, that's a big part of our ability to fulfill the governor's pledge. Thank you. You all set, Representative Foster? Yes, sir. Representative Thank Barry, you. you have more questions? I do just one more, um, which, uh, you know, thinking about um, Representative Foster's questions uh, provoked, which is, um, the federal government, you mentioned the RDOF funding, which Starlink received and, and you know, many private providers have been uh, receiving federal funds um, separate from what has gone to the Maine Connectivity Authority um, and what we've allocated to Connect Maine. Uh, but one of those funds that um, you, or I guess maybe it was Tim Schneider um, reminded this committee about when he came before us a few months ago uh, between sessions was the emergency broadband benefit. And um, I believe that wireless providers, correct me if I'm wrong, but wireless uh, providers can opt into that. And um, residents of Maine um, who are below, I think it's 125% of poverty level, um, are able to receive uh, between 30 and even up to, I believe it's $75 um, a month in um, assistance to help to be able to afford a, a, a wireless or wired um, broadband connection. Is that correct? Um, yes, uh, yes it is. And just to, with a couple clarifications. Mm -hmm. um, so the emergency broadband, and sorry if folks are already up to speed on this, but just to clarify, the emergency broadband benefit program has now evolved into the affordable connectivity program. Um, which now provides, as opposed to $50 a month, it provides $30 a month, um, uh, which is, you know, better, better than nothing. Um, part of the challenge of the program is it requires the service provider to administer the benefits um, on an income qualification standpoint, which has our internet service providers doing the job that large public sector organizations often find themselves in the role of doing. Um, I think that's been one of the reasons why the utilization of that fund was so much lower than subscribed. I, I think the uh, EBB emergency broadband benefit program had 2 billion allocated to it. And I think they had like, you know, 20 million or less used. Um, so, you know, some people used it, but not nearly enough people. And so I think part of that is the access and part of that was the challenge. Now, um, our federal funds that will define the majority of work that uh, the connectivity authority is embarking upon require that uh, any partnership that we invest in is an active participant in the affordable connectivity program. So if we're providing a grant to a service pro provider through our capital projects funds, they will have to have registered on the affordable connectivity program to make sure that their consumers are able to access those funds. One of the initiatives um, we're getting started in feasibility and I'd love to have in place by this summer would be some kind of aggregated administration on behalf of the service providers to make it easier for them to administer. So can we as a state be a proactive partner with the private sector and recognize, you know, this is a this is a, an added level of challenge for them to be able to provide that kind of affordability. Um, can we help increase that efficiency in administration? I don't quite know what that looks like yet. It may not necessarily work. I need to get the input from our private sector partners to better understand how we should be designing that kind of program. But I think one of our goals is 
that is a subsidy that is built into federal funds that doesn't necessarily have to impact our funds, but would provide benefit to our consumers. Um, so how do we make it easier to do? Um, and that is sort of one of those initiatives that will fit into our priorities to advance digital equity. Great. Senator Barry, Thank you. any follow-up? Thank you. And I, I think the 75% was for um, uh, tribal customers only. Um, just to clarify, there, yes. th that figure I think still uh, does apply in those instances. I think, you're, yes, I believe you were right. Thank you. Anything further, Representative Barry? All set. Any other questions from the committee? I do have a couple before we let you go, Andrew, and I was very interested in, in both Representative Foster and Representative Barry's questions because they were getting more to um, what I think are gonna be the challenges in this you know, um, challenge the, the governor has given to the legislature and to uh, your organization to meet this goal. Um, first off, um, do you see, well, I mean, I've traveled to many rural and remote areas of Maine. My grandfather was born in a place called, you know, T18 R7. And there are many, many uh, remote areas in Maine. Do you see um, the goal of 100% applying to residential only or also to commercial? Um, thank you, Senator Lawrence. Uh, quick clarification, when you say is the goal of 100%, are you referring to the governor's pledge of 100% uh, connectivity? Correct. And uh, so uh, is it applying to con uh, residential or commercial? Is that is your or question? Both. Or both, yeah, yes. I believe it's both. Okay. And some of these places are very remote that I've traveled to. I have constituents who actually have a place down here, but they own a remote sporting camp and they are there year round and they don't have electricity. They have their own internal generation. So they don't have any wires going out to their place. Um, you know, they are in, and I remember flying into airstrips in Maine where there was one person there living in what you, a mobile home for lack of a better word on the airstrip and they had no electric connection and all they did was tie up the planes when they landed and they lived in that place, um, you know, year round, essentially. How, do, are you comfortable that, well, we're, I'm not gonna put you in that position, but can you give me an idea of where you think satellite technology is now at being able to reach all these remote corners of Maine and kind of what has to happen. Just give us a perspective, and I'm not holding you to this, but I kind of want to know where things are at as far as satellite technology and how far we have to go to reach all these remote corners in Maine. Um, yes, uh, thank you. And for a minute, I thought you were going to ask, am I, am I comfortable with committing to providing the airstrip individual? With certain, and I, was, I, I am not comfortable. No, I, I, I'm not going to put you in that position. Um, I'm just trying to figure out where we are at technology wise now because so, i think that is not a wire solution that's a that's a um, a non-wire solution and where yes. is the technology at on so, targeting those parts of maine absolutely so this is uh, uh very much baked into our strategies and priorities and that in recognizing that technology is advancing at such a rate that we should be able to keep the door open for applying advancements in new technology to the places that make the most sense. That caveat is the really important part to the places that make the most sense. So one of the things that I'm charging our innovation working group with doing is helping develop a methodology of the places that make the most sense for different technologies. I am not a low earth orbit satellite expert and I absolutely would not pretend to be. Um, what I do know is that there are advancements that we should be considering. Some people are getting access to it and are getting great results. Others people are, other people are not. Other people are finding it very challenging from an affordability standpoint. For $500, you can now be a premium Starlink member. Um, uh, so that said, we absolutely should be considering how we can provide those kinds of services for the people that want it. And that's the other part of the equation. I think that was the other part of the governor's pledge. If you want connectivity and, you know, acknowledging there are those remote camps uh, for many people in Maine who don't want it. 
Um, and I think we need to be mindful of that. Um, I also think that we need to be mindful of enabling people to be able to, uh, you know, enjoy and embrace the quality of life in Maine um, that doesn't require their sacrifice of their professional or educational or even healthcare uh, opportunities. So the, the short answer to your question is that um, I don't really know. And that's why we as an organization, I think, have the opportunity to be proactive in our public and academic partnerships to be able to uh, better understand what our options are and also make sure that we as a state are able to keep pace with advancements in technology, right? We don't have to fully commit to satellite technology to be able to deploy it in the places that make the most sense. And so just to leave you with, and I'm going to ask you not to respond to this now, but to think about this. Are we also committing to providing uh, high-speed internet to people traveling in remote areas in Maine, not just living or working, but if someone goes on a canoe trip down the Allagash or they're taking a truck into uh, you know, uh, remote areas of Maine to bring out logs and things like that, are we also committing to providing high-speed internet for those people? while they're doing those services? I think that's, and that's, a different... that's a question I don't know the answer to. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. I, I do think that that's a different animal. Yep. Um, and um, I think that, um, you know, I think partnerships with our cellular providers. Um, and again, this is where one set of strategies can be complementary to another in that partnerships with our cellular providers um, actually should have an implication on some of our middle mile and backbone infrastructure and investments. Um, and so, um, you know, I think if cellular providers um, feel like those are markets that um, are able to capture and they think that they can do that in such a way that um, we benefit additional middle mile infrastructure and uh, fiber backhaul. Um, that to me feels like the kind of thing that would be a little bit more in line with the, with the animal that we're chasing. Um, but um, I, don't, I don't think inherently that kind of uh, interim or traveler orientation and strategy is, is baked into the pledge. Okay, good. Any other questions from committee members? Seeing none, thank you very much, Andrew, and thank you, Peggy, um, for being here. And we'll now go on to our next presentation. Lindsay, why don't you just announce to the committee who we're gonna be hearing from? Um, so at this point, I believe, are were we going to hear from Ms. Schaefer uh, regarding oh, the next she, I'm sorry, Andrew, does she have something she wants to add? Oh, yeah, I, uh, I think that, um, that that's entirely up to you all. Of course, I do know that Connect Maine is, has a tremendous amount of activity underway. Um, and uh, I'll leave it to Peggy to share. And Peggy, I'm so sorry to have gone on too long and I'm sorry I'm gonna have to duck out and miss your portion. I apologize, Peggy. I didn't realize you were doing separate presentations. So Peggy. Well, I have a legislatively required presentation that yep. I'm supposed to give. So I can blow it off if you want, because it's your no, presentation. No, no, I apologize. <laughs> I didn't recognize that, Peggy. So go ahead. So I'm gonna share my screen, I think, just for a little bit. Um, Thank you all. Thank you, Andrew. All right, so um, my requirement for the legislature is to give you an update on our, our annual report, two pieces. One is our annual report and one is the um, very exciting policy and procedures that we have to put in place. So um, hope you've had a lot of caffeine. Um, so this past year, we had a really sort of busy year in, at Connect Maine. Um, you know, I break these up into sort of three places. Um, the first is our, our community support. As you remember in 2015, the legislature gave Connect Maine the authority and the responsibility to start a community planning effort. And we have, um, essentially refined the community planning effort uh, just about with every round, right? We learned something and we changed the application. Um, and so the couple pieces that we created this year, we instituted what we call a statewide community of practice uh, with community boosters. And what this is, is, you know, we've been providing community uh, planning grants for a while and um, 
what we're trying to do is uh, make sure that people who are doing this work in the community have the advantage of talking with each other to learn from each other. So the experienced people can learn from the new and the new can learn from the old and maybe we can skip some of the potholes that people hit. So we have a community of practice um, that we're working with the Maine Broadband Coalition um, at, to put in place. They meet, I think monthly uh, for about an hour um, and they talk over a whole variety of, of activities. So they do, it's, it's a huge piece about learning from each other. Um, we're also putting in place a group called Community Boosters and those are uh, probably, they're probably gonna be one person per county. Um, and it's intended to add capacity to the community planning activity. So the community boosters are essentially a stipend uh, position. They're not a full-time position. There is a stipend for, uh, to add capacity to the organizations that are doing this work. Um, this is an idea actually we got from um, uh, Land O'Lakes. Uh, out in the Midwest, they're doing something similar to this. And when we looked at it, we thought this is a help, right? This is gonna help us continue to move these community conversations forward and down the road. Um, last year, we implemented a, a crowdsourcing. Um, and I think we have, I don't know, 27,000 crowdsourced tests right now. Um, again, we put this in place in a large part because we really wanted, um, we know that identifying what areas are served and unserved down to the street level, right, is a, is, has always been a sort of a block. And so this gives those communities a chance to not only engage their neighbors in this conversation, which is really important, but also get an idea of where actually service is and service, service is in their town. So this crowdsourced speed testing has been helpful. We have added that data. Uh, both to our um, broadband intelligence platform, as well as the, um, the federal uh, NTIA platform, which is called the National Broadband Availability Map. Uh, we've been working with Vetro uh, Fiber, who is our uh, broadband intelligence platform provider. And they uh, have been working, they've been working with uh, 10 communities, giving them access to the uh, broadband, to, the, to, their, to their mapping network so that the, those communities can really begin to have essentially the same technology that an ISP would have. So again, we're trying to figure out how to layer in this support so these communities have the, have the knowledge and understanding to really move these conversations forward. Um, we, like I said, have revamped planning grants, I think four times. Um, one of the things we did was we changed, we used to have phase one that you had to do, right? We dumped the phase one and started with a, what we're calling startup grants, which every month uh, towns can come in and say, we'd like to start this process. Here's who, you know, here's what we'd like to think about doing. We write them a check. Uh, there's no scoring process. It's a very simple application. We write them a check. We put the contract in place. It says, here are the things you need to do. Um, and it puts them in a place where they can come in for a phase two much faster. Um, we've provided 20 community planning grants this past year all across the state. Um, and just recently we've started a technical assistance uh, portal for broadband utility districts. Um, at our February meeting uh, next week, the board will be looking at an RFP uh, to provide technical assistance to those broadband uh, utility districts. So rather than um, get them into the uh, the sort of competitive community grant process, we're gonna have a special, like I call it door number three, um, where if you're a broadband utility district, we have a technical assistance platform in place, including consultants to work with you through this process if you're interested in that. So um, those are kinds of the efforts that we've been trying to do to expand community support. For infrastructure, we put in place uh, a number of things this year. You know, one of the things that we talked about um, when we did the uh, general fund obligation bond was that we were going to have to get a lot more, um, uh, we were going to, have to do a lot more follow up with people who get grants, right? So we put in a verification and validation process. This process, not only on the front end of the grant, in terms of making sure they're eligible, making sure they meet the requirements, making sure that their, their technology is up to stuff, and also making sure that, um, that their cost per pass is, is within the industry standards. On the back end, we have a validation process, which is when they submit invoices to, to us to get reimbursed, it has to be an invoice. It has to be an invoice of what they bought. 
Um, this is state fund bond money that we're paying interest on. And we just, we want to make sure that we know what that what we're paying for. Um, also, when these projects are done, we, we are sending out a field team to look to make sure that what they built meets industry standards and um, matches what they said they were going to build in the grant. The broadband intelligence platform is a pretty extensive platform that we've used. Um, I will have to say we've just barely hit probably 20% of the capacity of what that grant program can do, what that platform can do. Um, we are using it in this particular round of infrastructure grants uh, to identify um, areas that you're going to serve. You draw them on a map um, and it tells us how many locations are unserved, how many are least, that least served, so under 25.3, how many are underserved. Um, and that's the calculation we use when we look at um, what you're doing for the, for the, when you're applying for a grant. We also um, are using that platform to make sure that we are not leaving orphans, right? So that people aren't picking out sort of an area that's easy to serve and leaving the people that are harder to serve off, which means they're much harder to get to um, next time. Um, we have revamped our grant process. Um, I urge you to look online at our grant. We got a lot of feedback about different things that we should be doing in our grant process, and we have adopted most of them. Um, we are looking at um, uh, cost per pass in a density format. We are giving uh, a high, higher priority to applications that are a majority of which are um, under 25.3. Um, we are taking into consideration community um, contribution based on their property value. So communities that have sort of a lower ability to tax we are providing them extra weight for the funding they put in. So we're doing a whole variety of things um, in our infrastructure grant process that are different than what we've done before and really emphasize the sort of policy goals that we have in place as a state. Um, last, was it just last winter? We did um, six and a half million dollars of uh, projects in 11 weeks, which is, I gotta say, a record time with CARES funding. And um, if you all remember the CARES funding, it was supposed to run out December 31st of 2020 and on December, and so people rushed, right? These were not inexpensive builds because we had to pay double overtime to get people to do them, right? Um, and on December 29th, Congress extended the deadline for a year. So that was nice. Um, we also uh, had our first round of grant applications in uh, March, and we funded uh, eight and a half million of the bond issue. We had 19 projects and we're covering 11,000 locations. Um, those projects are ongoing. Uh, you know, if you follow uh, Bill Varney on Facebook, you will see him putting up fiber all around Rockwood and up, up to Jackman. That's one of those projects. We also applied for a $28 million NTIA grant, which is seven different project areas that range from Rangeley to Idaho. Um, we have three different providers and three municipal projects in that grant. We are still waiting to hear whether we've got it or not. That project will cover 15,000 locations. So that's about $2,000 a pass. Um, that we use the broadband intelligence platform very extensively in that process, both to answer to the challenges that were provided uh, to the areas that we were going to serve, as well as to identify areas that met the NTIA priorities. Um, we currently have a $16.5 million grant run open, uh, which is a combination, as Andrew said, of our last of our general fund, about six and a half uh, million and $10 million from the Maine Connectivity Authority of their American Rescue Plan funds. Digital inclusion, we worked with CDBG and the National Digital Equity Center. We augmented a grant that CDBG had given them uh, for um, tablets to include laptops. We, we paid for laptops for people who need laptops. We helped the, Pas uh, the Passamaquoddy at Pleasant Point apply for 2.5 a million dollar digital inclusion project through NTA that is also still pending. Um, and we have been working to publicize the EBV program and shifting now to the American, uh, to whatever that is, ACP program. That, as Andrew said, has some, there's some federal requirements around that, that the that FCC has tried to fix as they shifted from the, ECB, the EBV to the ACP program, which includes a lot more support to get people connected. So that's really important. Now for the really exciting stuff our policy and procedure manual. So we did adopt, um, you know, these years sort of blur after a minute. We did adopt new policy and procedures, I believe last, um, 
uh, in February of 2000 of 2021, we, it turns out we didn't really have, um, we had the bare bones that you need for statutory requirements for an independent agency, but we didn't really have the in-depth procedures that we really needed. And once we began to look at doing contracts and um, you know beyond what we normally do, we be, needed. We knew we needed to put new processes in place. So um, we uh, create. We actually um, no pride in authorship ship here. Um, we went to Fame and said, you know, the uh, idea committee has liked your policy and procedures. Can you send them to us? And we essentially adopted Fame's policy and procedures. So um, they're very good. Um, they're very comprehensive, and it puts in place uh, specific procurement processes. It outlines what needs to be part of an RFP. It puts in place specific, appro specific approval for payment process for all invoices. Um, and finally, we set up um, a process where the board chair who signs off on most of this stuff can set a designee if that person is out of pocket or there is potential conflict of interest. So um, I think you have our um, and a report that we provided to the legislature as well as the details on this policy and procedures. Uh, we did make some exceptions last year in, uh, in the policy and procedure process. One was the crowdsource speed testing, which was a $30,000 contract with uh, Greater Portland Council of Governments. Uh, we brought on board, um, I forget the name now, CB, uh, the Consensus Building Institute to do a public outreach around our grants and also a public outreach for Maine Connectivity Authority. Um, and finally, we had to do these two things. Um, halfway through last year, we discovered, um, we had, you know, I don't know if you remember, we moved into state government in 20, I think 19, uh, so that our all of our funding would go through state government. Um, we about three quarters of the way through the year, because the controller's uh, uh, office came back to us and said, we couldn't do that. We had to actually move back outside of state government. So um, we recontracted with the company that we had before, Solix, who does all the assessments that we do, that we connect to do, to go back to do our financing. And the final no contract award was with an auditor. Um, and again, we had to, because we had to move back outside of state government, we had to have an outside, and we're a public entity, we had to have an audit. And because we got federal money, we had to have a federal audit. And so we, um, there was a very limited time period to do that. So we contracted with the people who had, do, had done our audit for the past 10 years. So those are the two exceptions we made to our process. Um, so the next thing that we've worked on is actually a six month strategy with um, MCA. I mean, the, law, the legislation required that we like come back to you with a report, this is it. Um, so, um, we have a six month strategy. We did this sort of on, because things are changing so rapidly with federal funding coming in and the work that needed to be done. Essentially the six month strategy is that Connect Maine will continue the work that we've been doing for the next six months, which is now till June, right? So we're gonna do the last mile grants. We're gonna continue the community planning process. We're gonna to continue to do that kind of policy outreach, um, community engagement. We're gonna we continue with uh, with the with the tools that we put in place that will move over to MCA in the summer, um, and that essentially, I mean, Andrew, Stephanie, and I meet. I couldn't tell you how many times a week. It is at least once a day, maybe more. We have a meeting in twenty minutes. Um, so you know, we have been working incredibly closely together. There's only three of us, right? So when we talk about sort of uh, duplications and overhead. There's only three of us. So there's not a lot of duplication going on. And there's also not a lot of overhead going on. Um, so we are building this strategy as we go. Um, it's a very cooperative relationship. Our goal has been very clearly not to disrupt the marketplace. We have built up a little bit ahead of steam here. And our goal is to keep pushing that head of steam forward. So that's, that's my report. Great, thank you very much, Peggy. Are there questions from the committee for Ms. Schaefer? Representative Barry. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Director Schaefer, for the update and the presentation and the annual report and all of your hard work. It's really impressive to see 
uh, how much has been accomplished in the past year. Um, I wanted to give you the opportunity to respond directly to the question that I posed to President Butcher around the governor's pledge to make sure that, you know, within two years that every, uh, every, every person in Maine who wants a high speed connection will be able to have it. And um, just to address, um, you know, in particular, I mean, obviously the feasibility of that and, uh, and, and in particular what specifically legislators can do uh, to help make sure that we uh, accomplish that challenge, rise to that challenge. So a couple of things, when um, we were all together and asked about this pledge, what we, um, what we looked at was what our, uh, who we've covered recently, what, what our unserved number was. So this is the unserved number. Um, so we have about 80,000 locations in the state that are unserved. It's about 12%. And when we looked at sort of what we have been sort of, um, let's call it paying or what the cost per pass has been, it's been about $2,000 in the uh, per cost per pass. So we did just quick math, right? If we do this and this and this, you know, we have enough money to do it. And I think we have enough, um, we know enough about the locations to do it. So I think we felt comfortable that the, uh, make a pledge of making sure that everybody um, that wanted a connection could get one was a reasonable one, right? And you, you've had this long conversation already about alternate technologies and people at the very end of the road and the sporting camp, so we won't go there, but that's all sort of part of the conversation. Um, we have a lot of work to do, right? And so I would say um, that there is, um, over the past five years, this legislature has taken a lot of proactive step to move us forward. The community planning piece, the broadband utility district, the revenue uh, ability for revenue generating things to include broadband, uh, giving the, the more authority to the PUC on pole attachment, the process PUC has undergone around pole attachment. You know, that's not done yet, but it's still, it's moving forward. We have a lot of we have a lot of good policies in place now, and now we actually have the money to do them. And so I think for right now, we're kind of set, right? We have, right, we have um, uh, two plans due to the federal, three plans due to the federal government. One is for the capital projects fund, how we're gonna use that first 128 million. The second is the, uh, a plan around the IIJA funds, which is, I don't know, it starts with hundred million and moves its way up. And the third actually is a digital equity plan that we have to put in place in this next year. So I think the, the thing that needs to keep, you know, not to mix metaphors here, but we really need to put our feet on the gas, keep our foot on the gas and put our shoulders to the wheel, right? I know that's a little bit, you know, Dukes of Hazard and Fred, Fred Flintstone, but that's really sort of, we need to keep doing what we're doing and we need to do it a little faster. And so that's the work. And so, the message from you has to be to your communities, move, right? Make decisions and move, right? Don't, a lot of times communities just kind of, but we really want community to drive this process, but they have to drive it. I mean, I know that Representative Ziegler has been working with Southwest Waldo. We've been working with Southwest Waldo. They really are on a great path. Um, and there's some very interesting things happening out there. We've been working with the Denmark area, a lot of regraded things happening up there. There's a big process going on right now in Arosta County. There's one starting in Washington County. There's a lot happening here and people just need to keep going. The, um, nobody should take this pledge as anything but actually a challenge for all of us to work together to meet this goal together. So does that answer your question? Great, Representative Barry, are you all set? I uh, follow up if I may, Mr. Chair. Okay, go ahead, Representative. Director Schaefer, yes, it, 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 it goes a long way to answering the question and I, I, I greatly appreciate it. Can you put a finer point on um, the you know, when you, when you talk about $2,000 a pass, I guess a, a couple things, questions come to mind for me. One is, um, is that, that means going past a, 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 a driveway, um, which could avail itself of that new connection, um, as I understand it, does it, does it actually mean take rate? And then I have a couple of quick follow-ups. It doesn't mean take rate, but it does mean drop. 
right? Okay. So there's two different things there. One is mm-hmm. one is the drop to your house, right? Yeah. And the other is whether you subscribe. And those are, though they sound the same, they are nowhere near the same. One is a customer has to say, I'm signing up. And the other is the, the technology has to be at your door. Mm-hmm. So, um, and one of the reasons we do this community planning process is to increase that take rate because you know, once you build these networks, they, they have to operate, right? And so take rate's really important. Um, and so that's one of the reasons that we really push this community planning process. So there's a bigger conversation in the community about why this uh, resource is so important to your community to get people to subscribe to it. And that's obviously true. affordability is a significant chunk of that take rate. Senator Barry, you can continue with your questions. Thank you. Um, so, you, you, you anticipated my, my next question, um, at least part of it, which is affordability. Can you just remind us what affordability standards um, are baked into that $2,000 to pass calculation and also what um, speed um, upload and download standards are baked in? So um, we have uh, this round, we are requiring 100 over 100. That's the adoption that our board adopted that in May. We put it back into rulemaking this fall. Um, so the grants we did last year, uh, the build standard was 10 over 10. But I just got to say, we are not ahead of the industry in Maine on this. We are not. We are following them. I mean, everybody thinks, oh, my God, they're... we are not. The industry in Maine has been building fiber for about five years with our funding. Um, and so we, we're not over our skis on this because we're following them, right? Our fiber networks are cheaper to operate and they're easier to maintain. And so um, some of our non, non-telephone companies like P- Pioneer and Premium Choice and GWI have been doing fiber for a while. Um, a lot of our telephone companies are now, the traditional ILEX, are now trying to build over their footprint with fiber, which is not inexpensive, right? Because you are essentially serving the same customer base with a new technology that costs you a capital put in place. So that's that's tricky. And LCI has been very, with one of our most successful grantees has been working very diligently to build over their, their DSL footprint uh, with fiber where they can. And we've been very supportive of it because they've been, they're, they're a competitive grant process, right? And CCI is now doing the same thing. So um, that's our build standard. We do require um, a affordability program. And in this round, we are, I believe, giving um, points for uh, signing up to, to, for, for saying you're going to participate in the, in the American, whatever it is, the Affordable Connectivity Program, as well as points if you have a, an additional uh, uh, affordability piece. We do look at the cost per service. Um, and we had a couple um, applications that didn't do well last year because their cost for the service was higher than others. You have additional questions, Representative Barry? I do. So it sounds like there's a little bit of a. It depends in the affordability piece, and um, you know because it's points, right? It's so so there. You know, it might depend on the the particular project and the region. And obviously, if I'm living, you know, um, 200 miles from nowhere, at the end of a logging road, it's it might cost me a little more, right? <laughs> um, so I, I don't. Well, we I don't underwrite think you, some of the capital, right? We mm-hmm. underwrite some of the capital for that. Um, and I will say some of the, um, you know, some of our rural builders, Premium Choice, uh, Pioneer, um, and now uh, CCI, they have very affordable packages, right? It's like 60 bucks for a gig. Mm-hmm. Great. Representative Barry, your question? Thank you. That's it. Okay. Representative Foster. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Ms. Schaefer. You've kind of answered this, but I'd like to get some clarification the uh, funding uh, financial aspect of this. Uh, What I think I heard you say was that we can do what has to be done to meet the uh, governor's expectations with the monies that we have or we have coming. My my question is, uh, how much of these funds are in place now that the state has a hands-on versus what you expect to have coming? And how assured are you that you can depend on those federal dollars. So the governor um, allocated, I think it was $21 million through the, of the American Rescue Plan money. Um, 
10 million this year, which is what we're distributing in this round and 11 million starting July 1st. Um, so that's in the bank. The capital projects fund money, which is I think 128 and change, that's a formula that um, the Fed set up. Um, and so that is, we have, what we have to do is submit a plan to release that money. In other words, we have to, we have to put in place a plan that meets the federal requirements. Um, uh, and it's, these are all COVID relief packages, right? So they have to meet federal requirements around that for us to get that money, but it's there, right? It, it, if we, we'll put together a plan, it will work with the feds, that money will be coming. We've gotten the first little chunk of administrative money. We're getting ready to put in um, the first what's called project plan for a larger chunk of money, including last mile funding uh, for another round of grants this calendar year. Um, and so that money's assured. The IIJA, which is the uh, 42 point something billion dollars that's going through the NTIA, that funding, um, we are guaranteed 100 million of that. And the next, the chunks after that based are going to be based on a new FCC map, which is not yet in place. So we don't know what that number will be. Um, and we won't know until the FCC numbers get in place. So we know we have 150 million plus another 100 million. Um, and then there will be additional funding after that. We just don't know exactly what that number is. If I may, Mr. Chair. Great, we're just about at 1030. So we're gonna take our break um, oh, for 15 could minutes. I, could I just have one follow up very quickly? Well, I don't know if there are people beyond you who have questions. So oh, okay. um, I don't know how long it's going to take to complete with Ms. Schaefer. So why don't we take our break and then we'll be back at 1045 and continue with questions for Ms. Schaefer. Okay, if everybody could mute and turn your video off, that would be great.
Okay, we are back on um, with Ms. Schaefer and a report from the uh, Connect Maine Authority. And I believe we were on questions. Uh, Representative Foster is posing a question. So if we could have Ms. Uh, Schaefer come back on, Representative Foster will complete with the questions that uh, Representative Foster has. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I apologize for interrupting earlier. I thought Ms. Shavers indicated she had to be away for a meeting uh, before we would be back. So, that's is she uh, still on, Jason? I I am not seeing her here, um, and she is not in the attendees at this point. Okay. Well, then we can go on to our work sessions. Uh, would somebody uh, please? text uh, Representative Grohowski because she had asked when we were going to get to the work session on her bill. And Lindsay, is the other thing we have to do a language review? Yes, language review on LD 1847. Okay. So has anyone heard from Representative Grohowski? We can give her a few minutes to get back and we can do the language review. Uh, before she gets back. Representative Barry, have you been in touch with her? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. No, I have not, but I do see that uh, Director Peggy Schaefer has been able to rejoin us. Oh, she has. Okay. Welcome back, uh, uh, Ms. Schaefer and Representative Foster, if you have your question. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. And Ms. Schaefer, very uh, briefly, uh, in regards to the funding that we discussed uh, earlier, on uh, on your website, uh, that uh, currently reflects the funding that has been there uh, for a while since the, including the bond and, and your annual amounts that are available. Uh, my question is, should communities uh, or community organizations that have uh, looked into this in the past uh, and maybe uh, did not proceed because of what funding was available then, uh, make sure and get back to you uh, in regards to the fact that now a bit more funding is available. Will that uh, increase, let's say, the uh, funding that might be available to communities versus what was there before? For, for, for projects they may have considered and decided not to go with. So, um... You know, we had a couple rounds, I think in the, in the, in the 2020, we had around, I forget uh, how much was asked, but we only had $750,000 to give out. So we, it was a very competitive round, one would say. Um, and certainly in this last round, last spring, it was again competitive. If you didn't score a 90, you didn't get a grant. Um, and so we had three projects actually that scored 87. Um, and I'm hoping all three of those projects come back in this round because obviously they were competitive in that round. They'll be competitive in this round. Um, and so, yes, if you've had a project that you've had hanging out for a while, dust it off, update it, um, and, and either come in this round. Um, my caution on that is you've had to do provider outreach already. If you, if you're going to come in this round or be prepared to come in when we open up another round, which will be a lot more funding. Um, later this year. I don't, we don't have a time frame on that yet, but this is that, that will be the first chunk of capital projects fund money. And so I believe Andrew's been tossing around numbers of probably, I think it's like 30 or 40 million uh, plus potentially revolving loan fund. So um, yeah, if you have a plan that you put on the shelf because you didn't think there was enough money to build it, dust it off, update it um, and look at our application process to, to make sure you have the right information and get moving on it again. Absolutely. Uh, if I may, Mr. Chair. So we had Representative Foster. So just to follow up on that, um, Shaver, will your, uh, because I refer most of my constituents, the communities that have brought this to my attention, I say, you know, your best bet is to go to Connect Maine website and proceed from there uh, directly uh, to get things going. Uh, will your uh, website be changed to, <laughs> reflect what you just told us? Uh, in other words, communities that may have already been turned down or otherwise would have that new information uh, or are you dependent on legislators to pass that on? No, I, you know, we are in, um, 
I, we are in constant communications with these people, right? So I, we, between the community practice and um, the work that the broadband coalition is doing and the work that we're doing, um, I, I cannot quite frankly think of a community project that has come in or that we know has been working on and we know most of them that we have not had a conversation with about time to get up, get, get back in and get going. So, um, you know, our web, I gotta say, I don't think anybody ever goes to our website, right? They, they call me, they email me, they, you know, they, nobody goes to our website. I, I wouldn't either, but um, we are, in, we are, we have a really great uh, commu- outreach and communication thing that, that you don't see on our website um, that we're doing all the time. Representative okay. Foster. Thank you, sir. Okay, Representative Ziegler. Um, don't feel bad, Dr. Schaefer. Nobody goes to my website either. Um, the community booster, uh, you're saying there's gonna be one for each county and they, they're the liaison uh, to you? Is that how that works? That, sort of, but not really. The, um, the, the intent of the community boosters is to help communities keep moving, right? So it's to add capacity in counties and to make sure that the community planning process keeps moving. So they may, the community booster may come to us. They, the, the committee chair may come to us. There's a whole variety of, of ways that people come, but the whole point of the community boosters is to continue to add um, the ability for communities to engage in this work. Cause there's just, this, you know, they got to be meetings scheduled, they have to get providers lined up, and all with volunteers, it's sort of hard to get that going. So the idea of a community booster is to add capacity to those community planning organizations so that stuff can get lined up and get going. So Ziegler, any follow-up? No, thanks. Okay, any other questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you very much, Ms. Schaefer, for being patient with us. Take care. Okay, though that ends the uh, two reports uh, we had to receive today. And I need to see if there's a quorum so we can go into a work session. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's Representative Cuddy. Okay, looks like we have a quorum. So I'll take a motion to go into work session. So moved. And is there a second? Don't everybody be shy. You're not shy on asking second. questions. Come on. I would second. Okay. And all those in favor of going into work session, just raise your hands. Okay, anybody opposed? Okay. So we're in work session now. Um, we have one bill to do that's substantive, and that's Representative Grohowski's bill. We also have a language review. Um, and is Representative Grohowski back? Yes, I am. Okay, great. So since you're here and you need to go into another committee, why don't we do your bill first? So uh, Lindsay, can you refresh my memory on the title of that bill? It's the Distributive Generation, right? Uh, this is LD 1819, an act to define discrete electric generating facility. Thank you. Uh, you had a work session on February 1st. Um, Representative Foster had moved ought not to pass and uh, Representative Carlo had seconded. So uh, then there was a move to table. Um, so there is a motion pending. Okay. I got the wrong D word. Um, so uh, why don't you go ahead? Do you have an amendment to propose Representative Grahowski? Uh, I have an approach to propose to the committee, okay. if that's all right. <laughs> Great. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I uh, did did send you all um, an email sort of in the later hours of last night. Um, so no worries if you haven't had time to look at it. But what I am proposing here is, you know, I heard a lot of the um, concerns about continuing to sort of tweak the program that's already in existence for net energy billing, you know, because we went through a process to do that last year. And so um, I I, uh, thank Representative Foster for thinking ahead to my my ultimate conclusion, which is that uh, we can, in my view, send a letter to that stakeholder group 
um, that we set up to discuss uh, any kind of distributed generation program moving forward to um, ask that group to think about this question of what is a discrete uh, generating facility and should there be any changes to the way the PUC has made the rule? Um, is there any merit to what is drafted in this bill? And put that to that stakeholder group for any sort of distributed generation 2.0 um, program as we've been calling it um, going forward and leaving the um, what's happening now in the current program uh, as is. So what I did was um, just draft up a couple bullet points that could go into a letter from the committee to ask um, the governor's energy office uh, to just see that this is something that is discussed in that ongoing stakeholder group and um, you know, clarify that we would like the Public Utilities Commission to definitely weigh in with that group and work collaboratively to figure out if there should be changes for a future program. So to be clear, this would be prospective, not related to the existing program, and it would be um, just some suggestions based on what we learned from the public hearing and the subsequent discussions. Um, and then we would uh, vote on not to pass on this bill as is and just send the letter. So I don't know if people have questions on the content of the letter or if it's helpful for me to just say quickly what it is, um, but it is based on the conversations that we've had so far. Why don't you go over briefly what's the bullet points you mentioned in your letter, and then I'll go to Representative Foster to see um, his reaction to that based upon his motion. Sure. Um, thank you for that. So, you know, a little, the first couple points are just sort of the background of things that we, um, that I learned and that I, that I myself and others shared with you in the public hearing, which is that there have been a lot, there has been a lot of confusion and a lot of requests for advisory rulings to the Public Utilities Commission uh, based on the existing rule around what is discrete and uh, mileage. Um, being a factor, uh, you know, a, a first factor that then triggers certain other um, tests, if you will. So, you know, the first bullet sort of acknowledges that that's the background, that there's a lot of confusion um, and it's taking, you know, commission's time to work through that uh, for better or worse. Um, the second bullet is that we recognize and appreciate that the PUC is trying to prevent gaming of the program. We think that's a good thing. Um, and that it would also be helpful to think about, um, are there any changes to those rules um, going forward that would be appropriate? Uh, and again, clarifying that this would not be any retroactive changes to the existing program. Um, <clears throat> it's that second bullet specifically mentions that there, I think is some, there's been some consequences where uh, different property owners that just happen to be within a mile um, have been uh, have not been able to develop their property in the way they want to, or because they maybe don't want to go through the PUC process to figure out are they allowed, are they not allowed, et cetera. So it sort of mentions the geography piece that we talked about. The third bullet um, is just stating like, yes, we created the uh, stakeholder group through LD 936, uh, directed by the GEO and in coordination with the PUC. Um, so it's just putting that fact out there. The next bullet point is saying um, that we, the committee, believe that that stakeholder process is the right place to have this discussion. And we would like, in the next bullet point, to ask the governor's energy office to include this charge um, and provide any recommendation when it comes back to us in the end uh, with the work. And finally, that as a member of the stakeholder group, we would like the PUC to, you know, actually work in the development of any language changes, if there are any, or maybe everyone discusses this and decides it's good as is. Um, so that's that's sort of the, the bullet points of the letter content that I'm proposing. Senator Foster, do you uh, have any comments, questions? Well, first of all, just as a technicality, Mr. Chair, uh, I'm not sure, I thought we would address the pending motion first, but uh, if you are looking for me to amend that in regards to Representative Grahowski's uh, proposal here, uh, I would be reluctant to in that, I believe from what I read and heard from the PUC, I'm comfortable that they, their current uh, definition uh, in statute uh, and, and their the way that they follow that is is uh, sufficient. 
And I would also contend that should the uh, DG stakeholder group wish to take this on, I don't think a, a, a formal letter from the committee is necessary to have them consider it as part of their work. Uh, and possibly simply a, a request from a representative might suffice. But uh, so I would, uh, I, I will stay with my present uh, motion that's on the floor. Thank you. That's correct, Representative Foster. That's where we are procedurally. Um, and I was seeing if you wanted to withdraw your motion and then have it ought not to pass with a letter. So we can are now are still debating your motion. So uh, we can, if there's any more debate, we can do that and then have a vote. And if they, somebody wants to propose a minority report of ought not to pass with a letter, they can do that. Um, so why don't we go into debate on the motion? The pending motion is ought not to pass. Representative Grohowski. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to um, address the comment by Representative Foster. Um, I hear your point. I will say that I shared this um, language with the Public Utilities Commission and the Governor's Energy Office and the feedback that I got, and I'm sure they would be willing to corroborate that was, we're fine with this. We think this is an approach we can work with. Um, we're happy to continue having that discussion. And the Governor's Energy Office just wanted me to clarify that it was prospective only. So I made a couple tweaks to the language from what I shared yesterday with them to make it clear that we're not talking about the existing program. We're talking about including this in a discussion of the future program. So I understand if you don't want to send a letter, it's not binding. Maybe it seems like unnecessary, but I think um, based on what I've learned through this process and the experience that's happened in my own community, I see that there's no harm in sending a letter and just asking for that feedback from the group personally. Representative Barry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So first, just a procedural clarification. So the, the pending motion is ought not to pass and yes. that's been made and, and seconded. I, I can't remember yes. by whom, <clears throat> um, but that, motion is ought not to pass without a letter. And so right. individuals uh, such as myself who might be comfortable with the committee report of ought not to pass um, should vote against the pending motion if we wish to include a letter. Is that correct? Right. I, I, so, I want to make sure that our, I, I do want to yep. make sure that our clerk can record this appropriately. Yep. And I'm, I'm a little concerned that um, if I vote against the pending motion, um, there may not be uh, an alternative <coughs> report on which the clerk can list me. So the pending motion is ought not to pass and you need to vote whether or not you're in favor of ought not to pass. And that is ought not to pass without a letter. Anyone voting against it will be asked if they want a minority report to come out that's different than the ought not to pass. And at that point, you or anybody else can state what your report is. And then the people voting against the motion will, will decide whether they're with you on your report or whether we're gonna have two, three, four reports coming out. Representative Barry. Thank you for that clarification. So um, I would like to share with the committee for what it's worth that I will be voting in favor of the pending motion made by Representative Foster, the motion of ought not to pass um, I will also be recommending that the committee approve a letter, um, such as has been outlined by Representative Grahowski. So Representative Barry, I'm a little confused um, because we won't, after ought not to pass, there is nothing for us to act upon at that point. Are you suggesting you don't want to do the ought not to pass without a letter, which is what is the motion of Representative Foster? Procedurally speaking, um, I, I do want to make sure that my vote is recorded as ought not to pass. And I don't believe that a committee report can be ought not to pass with a letter. I think it's either ought not to pass or ought to pass or ought to pass is amended. So my understanding is we can do ought not to pass with a letter, but if that's where you're at, um, I'll have to get a procedural ruling on that and find out if we can do that. 
Um, normally what we do is do ought not to pass and say we're going to send a letter. But Representative Foster has made it clear that his motion is ought not to pass and not to send a letter. So if you're voting in favor of his motion, it would be ought not to pass without a letter. Senator Vitelli. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, in the hopes that this might get us out of this procedural quandary, I would be willing to vote against Representative Foster's motion, much as it pains me, and would then issue a minority report that we ought not to pass with the letter. Any other debate or discussion? Uh, Representative Barry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess I want to turn to our committee analyst and just ask if um, ought not to pass with a letter is something that can be reported out to the full legislature. As I understood it, I think the you can have the ought not to pass vote and then a separate discussion with regard to a letter, but honestly, I'd have to look into that. I, I'm not 100% sure. Mm -hmm. And, and I believe before we have a discussion regarding a letter, we have to have something pending before our committee to do that. So once we all vote ought not to pass without a letter, this matter is done. So we, if you wanna wait and we get some clarification on that, I'm more than happy to. Representative Barry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just for, uh, just, just for clarity and, and to make sure that we have um, made ourselves absolutely clear for the purpose of uh, the, the work our analyst and, and clerk need to do, um, I intend to vote in favor, and I wanna suggest that we just, just do this together if possible, that we, that we vote on one thing at a time. We first vote on, on what, what our committee recommendation will be. Um, I do support the idea of a letter, but I would suggest that that is a different kind of vehicle. It's, it's, not, um, it's not a vote on the legislation per se. And the committee can vote on whether to send a letter to anyone at any time um, without even being in work session. So I, I would offer um, to recommend a letter and, and ask the committee to vote on that separately once we voted on the pending motion. Okay, well, before I'd entertain that, I'd need some kind of clarification if a committee can, you know, do that at any time without having legislation. Uh, Senator Lawrence, that's something I'd be happy to check on. Um, I can't get right. an answer just at this moment, but if um, I don't know procedurally what would be best um, yep. for me to look into that, but I will check. Representative Grahowski? Would it be possible to take the motion back, just do the letter for whoever wants to do it and then do the motion. That way we'd still be in the work session for this bill and then we could kill the bill and move on. So that gets a little confusing because we'd have to have a vote to send out a letter and then we'd have to table the ought not to pass. Why would we have to table the ought not to pass? Well, you're saying till we get the letter out no, I'm saying it, it sounds like we're having a, an issue of the order of operations here. And because there's a pending motion on the table, we can't act on just doing the letter thing. So if the pending motion came, was rescinded, we could talk about the letter, vote on the letter. Then Representative Foster could put his motion back out. Then we could ought not to pass this bill. Well, I'd be willing to try it that way. I'm, I'm not sure procedurally it is correct because when a committee votes ought not to pass, the, the bill essentially goes into the dead bill file. It never appears on the calendar of um, either the House or the Senate. So that's, I'm not that's sure good. We don't, we don't want to put the letter on the calendar of the House and Senate. That's correct. Internal correct. Committee operation. So I think that's a good outcome. So Senator Vitelli, do you have some clarification? I'm not absolutely positive of this, of this. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. But I know from my past experience that the former committee that I served on would fairly regularly send letters from the committee to commissioners or other officials to address issues outside of or but perhaps stemming from a particular piece of legislation. So 
I guess I would think we could do that after we vote ought not to pass on the bill itself. We could take up the idea of sending a letter. But I would okay. defer to you and to our analysts to confirm that as needed. Okay, so Representative Foster. So uh, I, I believe I agree with Senator Vitelli on this and uh, I, I, my purpose here is to kill the bill, uh, obviously. Uh, but I do believe that uh, Representative Grahowski has the ability to bring forward a letter and then we vote on that separately. I think we, even in my short time in the legislature, we have done that before in this committee where we killed the bill and then just simply put together a letter and voted on that and sent it or not. So I think uh, that seems right to me, but obviously uh, we would, our, our analysts would uh, probably have a better answer at some point in time. Yeah, I, I'm comfortable with what you're saying to the extent that that is usually done as unanimous consent of the committee in my experience. And here we have a divided question about whether or not to send a letter. And then I don't know how that's dealt with in a committee. Do we then have only the members say, this is only from certain members? You know, when we send out that letter, I've never seen that done before. So that is where I'm getting confused is that normally when we get this letter point, we say it's a unanimous letter from the committee. Representative Kessler, you're waiting to clarify our situation. <laughs> Motion to table uh, while we figure out the logistics of this. Thank you. Okay. Been moved to table. Is there a second? Representative Grahowski? Representative, is there a second to the tabling motion? I would second. Okay, it's been seconded by Representative Cuddy. All those in favor of tabling? Okay, we have one, two. Just for 15 minutes. Three, four. And all those opposed, raise your hands. One, two, three, four. So the motion to table fails. The pending question before the committee is still ought not to pass. So with that, I'll just, if nobody has any more debate or discussion, ask for a, uh, a, a roll call vote on the ought not to pass. Okay, so Jason, why don't you call the roll? Um, I, I think a couple of us had our hands up, Senator, but I don't I apologize, I missed that. I apologize. Rep. Senator Grahowski. Thank you, um, really sorry about, I mean, I guess we're learning a lot always together, so that's great. Um, I, I do believe this committee has sent letters before where just people's names were removed from the letterhead and it's stated in the letter, you know, these are the members that approved the letter. I, th I think we've done that before or I've seen it in other committees done um, uh, I've seen it in ENR for sure. Um, so that could be separate from this vote. We can deal with it another day, I guess. Okay. I personally have never seen that on a committee, but Representative Perry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I will be, um, eager to sign on to the letter as drafted by Rep Representative Grahowski with help from our analyst and to put my name to it. Um, I, uh, I, I don't think we need a formal vote in order to put our names on a letter, but um, if if there is a, a motion to do that, and you know that would be that would be fine by me as well. Um, <clears throat> I do recall times on this committee before where where we have done that, and um, you know perhaps we can uh, circle back on this issue and just discuss for for future purposes of the committee um, the best procedure to deal with this situation in the future. And I see that our analyst has her hand up. Yes, um, I, Lindsay. Um, I sent a note internally and a vote on the bill is a vote on the bill. Um, you can have a separate discussion on the letter. Um, so if the committee did decide that they wanted to move forward with ought not to pass, um, there, would be, there could then be a separate conversation about the letter. And if the committee is divided on the letter, you can identify who it's from. And if it's a majority of the committee, then it does it become an action of the committee? 
and we have to identify who is opposed to it? Um, I think at that point, if you if the committee was not unanimous in in sending out the letter, um, it wouldn't be from the entire committee. So I think then we'd have to determine right. who was on board and who wasn't. Um, but that's certainly right. I'm going to get more information for the committee yep. on how on the logistics of this process, just so going forward, I know. Um, so at least and, with and I, have, yep, I have seen that before, Lindsay, and I think we need to get that clarified yep. where members of a committee, but it doesn't come out on committee letterhead or it's clearly from only the two chairs that has happened before. Um, so we'll we can figure out uh, down the road how to do that. Yes. Um, other hands up, pending motion is ought not to pass. Okay, Jason, why don't you call the roll? Okay, uh, Senator Lawrence. Yes. Senator Lawrence is a yes. Senator Vitelli. Yes. Senator Vitelli is a yes. Senator Stewart is absent. Representative Barry. Yes. Representative Barry is a yes. Representative Cuddy. Yes. Representative Cuddy is a yes. Representative Krahowski. Yes. Representative Krahowski is a yes. Representative Kessler. Yes. Representative Kessler is a yes. Representative Ziegler. Yes. Representative Ziegler is a yes. Representative Sachs is absent. Representative Wadsworth is absent. Rep. Senator Grignon absent. Representative Foster. Yes. Representative Foster is a yes. Representative Carlo is absent. Have eight in favor of the motion. Okay, eight members having voted in favor and um, five members being absent, the motion prevails. Okay, so now we have a language review and hopefully this will be simpler, but having said that, knock on wood, um, we may, it may take us a little bit longer, but we'll see. So Lindsay, why don't you bring the language uh, review before us? Excellent, all right, I'm going to send that out now. So that should be coming to your inbox and I will share my screen. Bear with me one moment. Okay, please let me know if you can see my screen. Yes. Excellent, thank you. Okay, so we are looking at um, LD 1847, an act to prohibit a public utility from terminating or disconnecting service to a public safety facility without advance notice and approval. Um, we had a majority and minority reports, both ought to pass as amended. So we will start with the minority report, if that's okay. Sure. Hearing no, okay. <laughs> um, let me just make this a little bit bigger. Okay, so starting with the minority report, um, this was representatives uh, Foster and Wadsworth and Senator Stewart. Um, so the amendment um, amends the bill to include an emergency preamble and basically directs the PUC to adopt rules governing the termination or disconnection of utility services from a public safety facility or public safety facility, excuse me, for non-payment of rates, fees, or charges. Um, the rules adopted by the PUC must establish a process for termination or disconnection reasonably designed to ensure adequate public safety. And these rules are routine technical. Any questions about the minority report from people voting on the minority report? Uh, no, uh, Mr. Chair, I, I'm on a roll now. So if anybody wants to join me in that uh, on house floor, I, <laughs> I'll be there. <coughs> okay. So we're comfortable with minority report. You have the majority report also? I do. Okay. Just please confirm that you can see my screen. Yes. Excellent, thank you. Okay, so this is the majority report. This is representatives Barry, Carlo, Cuddy, Grahowski, Kessler, Sachs, Ziegler, and Senators Lawrence and Vitelli. Um, so the majority report, um, the amendment includes adding an emergency preamble 
and limiting the applicability to of the this process to situations in which um, it's non-payment. So non-payment of rates, fees, or charges for utility service. And scroll down. Okay. Next was including a penalty provision. Um, existing statute, section 1508A, gives the Public Utilities Commission the ability to assess administrative penalties. Um, however, existing law, um, it's discretionary, and there are um, sort of various, um, there's a framework uh, that the PUC would use to make that determination. Um, so as instructed by the committee, um, I worked with Representative Barry on this language. And so I'll walk you through kind of, it's a lot of text. Um, it's pulled over from section 1508A, um, but there are some changes to it. So I'll walk you through what those are. So this penalty provision would basically require the PUC, so it's not a discretionary penalty, um, require the PUC to assess um, penalties for violations. Subparagraph A talks, of, or paragraph A, excuse me, talks about violations um, of the section they will impose an administrative penalty for each violation in an amount between 0.1% and 0.25% of the annual gross revenue of the public utility received from sales in the state. Um, each day a violation continues constitutes a separate offense and the maximum administrative penalty for a series of violations may not exceed 5% of annual gross revenue. So that is sort of the general penalty provision. In the event that a public utility was notified by the PUC that they were not in compliance with the requirements of the section, and they were advised that failure to comply could result in a penalty, um, the commission shall impose an additional administrative penalty in an amount between 0.1% and 0.25% of the annual gross revenue for each violation. And then lastly, in paragraph C, um, it basically in determining how much of a penalty to its assess, the PUC shall consider um, basically the considerations that are in existing law. Um, so those relate to um, the severity of the violation, including the intent um, of the violator, the nature and circumstances, extent and gravity, um, the reasonableness of the public utilities belief um, that their action or lack of action was in conformity with the title, um, history of previous violations, um, an amount necessary to deter future violations, and then uh, such other matters as justice requires. So I don't know, should I stop there and see if folks have questions on the penalty provision specifically? No, you can go through the whole thing and we'll see if people have questions. Okay. And then lastly, um, the commission shall adopt or amend rules um, to ensure that any process or system changes made by a public utility to comply with this section are cost effective, result in operation and maintenance costs that are prudent and reasonable and do not involve capital investment. Okay, questions for Lindsay. I'm gonna stop Sorry, I my gotta screen. get to my hands. I don't see any questions for Lindsay. So is everybody comfortable with the majority report? Okay, so there's nothing more we have to do on that. All the right. language is approved. So you're all set to go, Lindsay. Is Wonderful. there anything else? Whoops, sorry. Um, did you want me to, um, you'd mentioned earlier the committee want, just wanted to kind of give an overview of what- Yeah, what I do wanna first. do that if you could, if you've got that Certainly. document. Yes. And I kind of want to show the committee what Representative Barry and I are working from so you get an idea of what we have left. Excellent. So I'm going to share. I actually prepared two documents, the one that we normally use, and then just sort of an overview. So I will share if my If you have screen. the sidebar, that's what I'm looking for, the yep. sidebar you have on what we normally use. How's that? Can you see my screen? Okay. So, yes, I can. And I'd direct uh, committee members a question or uh, attention to that sidebar. And the first section is voted on and needs language review. So the next section is needs public hearing. So you see we have six bills left to be public hearing. And then we have 16 that need work session. And this is the hold up here. So I'd ask you to review that list, look at it. If you need Lindsay to provide you with that list, you can, or you can take a screenshot of it or whatever you need. 
And if you see a bill of yours on that list or your caucuses, I'd ask you to contact the people and see if we can get um, these bills uh, going and get them resolved. And again, uh, my suggestion is you contact directly uh, Lindsay to let her know the status of that bill. So I see, for example, uh, Representative Grahowski has, is it three on there I see? Senator Vitelli has three, Senator Stewart has three. <clears throat> so that's nine, that's over half of the bills right there. So we need to begin to focus on the bills that committee members have uh, that are tabled that we can move, uh, that are on work session that we need to move forward. Any questions on that? And this is just me cracking the whip. Um, Representative Foster, since you're the only person on from your side, if you could just look at what is on from your side and just give it a little nudge to uh, Representative Wadsworth and Senator Stewart that we need to start dealing with these. That will be fine. I'll do that if, if uh, Lindsay would send me the uh, that sheet. Thank you. Okay. Any questions? Okay, that ends our work session and hopefully this will give, when we begin to get people back reporting they're ready to go with their bills, it'll give Seth and I the ability to begin putting these on for work session. Otherwise we may just begin setting them all on for work session uh, with the idea that um, that will push people to get an answer on where they're at. Okay. We'll see everybody on Tuesday for public hearings. Have a great weekend.